toolkit one here and I'm just going to upload a, a really large image uh, and see what we got here. So the login as a member. So the question here is uh, if we're loading up a, a profile picture, and I think I turned this on last week, so it should be available for me. Um, if we're loading that large profile picture, it should normally uh, try to crop it down to something smaller. So, um, so recommended size 1140 by 200 pixels. Now I would expect, and this is what we're talking about, that if, if that's the size I want, that outline of the, uh, you know, on their photo would have that, or at least those dimensions, right? So if, if for some reason they're trying to expand it up to, um, a 300 pixel wide, I guess it would it would then go uh, or hide, go wider, but then it would obviously be those same dimensions and, and shrink it down to whatever fits in the spot, right? Right. So let me, let me just go find a, a really large picture here. Actually, let me just do this. I'm gonna just to verify here. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my jump story account and just download a, a random image. I'm gonna make sure I get a a big one. Um, so anyway, this is one uh, I think John mentioned this. We talked images last week, so this is one uh, that I use, and uh, but it's obviously not free like some of the other ones we did. But does have uh, some really good images on there. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna download whatever comes up here. Um, fear. That sounds. Uh, I don't want to do fear. That'd be terrible. How about happiness? Let's go. And I'll just download a full uh, full picture here. That looks fun. Somebody, actually, I'll do this one. Nice big image image of the mountains, and this guy's happy. All right, so now we got that uh, large picture in our thing there. So I'm gonna go ahead and upload that large picture. And again, this is just a, a normal big square picture, is what this is. So that um, that will be cropped down. Oops, I don't want that. Okay, so now, does Jamie, does yours look like that then, right? If it if it comes yeah. too big, it has that outline on it, and so you're saying pull, pull you're down not the the, uh, the crop, pull it down. Like the um, the blue middle. Well, let me. Piece. I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna do the first case. Okay. You said I'm not touching anything. I'm not dragging. It. I'm just yep. gonna confirm it, right? So okay. at least on mine, I'm not touching it. Not doing anything. I'm just gonna confirm the upload, and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm thinking it's gonna crop it to exactly where it's highlighted, and that's what it did. Okay. So that okay. that works so on mine. Right. That's how it should work. And then I'm gonna change the cover. And so here's this question. Um, that's what I recommend, right? But um, the when you're doing that, obviously they don't necessarily do what you tell them to do. So the question right. is, uh, what does it look like uh, when you try to change it or what does the system do? So now if I, obviously I think every, so it looks like I, when I do the corner one, it's not shrinking. I would expect that to, to do at the, at the right, at the angle. Well, stop or it, it shrink it's down locked. after that. At that ratio, right? Right. It should lock in. Go all the way down. Go down even more. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just seeing. So I, it's not oh. letting me shrink the, uh, the sideways, at least on mine. So, which is good. Well, no, because I, let's say I want that. I, I only, I don't want this part of the hill. I only want right, right, that. Right, right. I should be able to shrink go that all down. The way. So anyway, go all the way down. But yeah. So I'm gonna. I'll just, I'll just highlight basically everything in here. Okay. Yep. And it lets me do the whole thing. Yeah. So Which I think what it should do at least is lock in that, at least that rectangle, because then you could resize your pictures. If you needed, if you wanted a certain piece, I mean, it would be nice if it actually resized for you. In, in that yeah, so let me door. let me go back in the settings. I'll just do this live. We talked about this last week too. I'm just going to go into the uh, it's in the developers image settings here. I don't see what I have what I have set. So that 
that up, upload picture we said it said 1140 by 200 that's a recommended size now we talked about this last week where in the image settings here it has max width and height and so i want to see what i have for the profile cover it says uh our free open ratio width of 1140 by 200 and so to me to me that's a problem because it it says max if, if, if i have a max height of 200 it, it should not be higher than 200. right um, and they're, they're, I forgot what they said. The reason why, or what they, I said it doesn't make sense. But look um, at the yeah. So you know what? I, I'm gonna have to look through my tickets. I think I've asked this question before as well. And the, the, I think the response, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. What you got? I think the response was basically. Um, this only sets the open ratio of the max that it's basically telling them to crop to. Um, you know, this basically sets that overlay screen of 1140 by 200. That's uh, so I'm just going to, I'll just do this as an example. I'm going to do 1140 by 600. I'm going to, I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to go back in and we're going to do that again. Now I'm, I'm betting again, this is, this is only going to change the overlay. So now instead of uh, that 200 high, I'm expecting to see it three times that tall on the upload. Yeah, she didn't even really give me an answer. Like a, so yeah, they don't have the feature to allow you to fix the size. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him this question because. Uh, uh, um, and I'll just, if you've already asked it, I'll just ask it again. Cause, cause I just changed the max to 600. I was expecting this one on the overlay to be three, you know, I expect it to be like that, right. Where it's three times. Um, but, but even, even that 1140 realize I'm uploading, I'm, I'm uploading this, this one. And as, as I think you guys uh, saw here, this is, this is 4,000. 4288 by 2848. So this is 4200 pixels wide. So, so even at that 11 1140, this is 4200 pixels wide. I mean, this is like four times as, as wide as I'm telling it the max it. So, um, well, it looks like it shrinks the picture into the 1140, but then it doesn't lock in the. Well, I don't think it shrinks down to 1140. I don't like that. Just happens to be the let me. Let me close this out. This just happens to be the full width of whatever it's at. I mean, that's not. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll see what that oh. actually is. Oh yeah, you can measure it. So, it's oh, it's close. It's like ten fifty seven, but that just happens to for my size, my, like if you got a bigger monitor, like Frank has an 80 inch monitor in front of his face right there, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is gonna be, you know, the full 4,000 pixels. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what, I don't know what to tell you now. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't work how I would think it would either. Um, and to be honest, yeah, I, I don't think it would be nice if it, if it fixed it that way, every listing looks unison, you know, it looks, cohesive but um yeah interesting the other i had one other question on on pictures if it's okay yeah let me let me do one thing real quick before we move on i'm just going to do something small i'm going to do 600 by 600 i'm just going to do a smaller i'm just going to do 400 by 400 i'm just going to try a smaller the minimum size for width setting okay well that's fine i'm going to change it for it i don't know and they don't have a drop down for open the ratios. Oh, either. the minimum is 820. That's interesting. Okay. So let me see if that, let me see if changing 820 did anything. Or by 100. Well, I mean, I already tried the 200 to 600. That didn't do anything. So I'm just going to yeah, change yeah. the word. Yeah, um, to be honest, it doesn't really matter what I do. It, 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 it doesn't read it. 
So I'm gonna I'll, I'll send a ticket on this one, and I'll, uh, I'll have them watch our entire webinar here to, to watch me do it. But um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem to be working. I would expect it either. So sorry for everybody watching. Hopefully, um, we'll go over that another week if I figure out what that is. But I I, I have a feeling that they're just gonna see that's how it works. It just uh, that's uh, but I, I don't. I, I'm still confused about the minimum maximum because it's either either that does something on the overlay or that's just a random size. But I can't I can't actually select the, the part of the image that I want because you basically have to have the width proper um, or your image. So you can't you can't. This is not a crop, you know, at that point. This is kind of like a height adjustment. Yeah, it'd be good if you can just really to lock it. Yeah. So is this is this baby the same thing on yours? You can't. You can't move it sideways. That's yeah, I can't. Up. Yeah, you, you want to go up and down. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Because I don't even know what this overlay. Obviously, that's just a, an extra overlay with a transparency background. I don't even know why that's over, you know a white a taller, but it's not changing based on what oh, image I'm uploading. I didn't notice the. Uh, you see the top part and the bottom part has the um, background, like the. I yeah. If that's the what you need. Thing. I wonder if when you change it to eight hundred, it did that. No, it was like that before. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Let me um, let me do uh, let me do another one here. I'm gonna do it smaller. So that was a really large image. So let me try it with a smaller image and see if that affects it. So let me just do. My little cover one here. This one's like 760 by 400. You gotta keep it at the same dimensions you had. Um. Well, I had I had it at at uh, 820 or whatever. So this one that's interesting. So I just changed that a little bit. I've got a little bit of play here, but not not a whole bunch. Um, you were able so that, what is that? You were able to bring it in a little bit. I'm just well, I just I just uploaded a, a smaller image just to see if that right. would do something. Um, and then so let me let me just change this again back to 1140 by 200 with a smaller image. Maybe by widening that out, I'll actually get more playroom. But oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, but obviously, obviously, it's not good if if we're taking this long as the uh, as the site administrator. None of nobody using your system is gonna be doing that, right? So it needs to be intuitive. So yeah, exactly, I mean, unless yeah. So yeah, by putting it by putting it down to uh, or larger, I lost all that side play. Now I can just move it up and down, but again, this is not it's not working. Which, which, which happens when that happens? Oh, I take that back. I, I can move it. Uh, it started out wide, but I was able to for the corner one uh, move it in just a tiny bit. So I, it seems to be the actual image size. The smaller the image, the oh, that doesn't make any sense either. No. So let me let me know. I'm just gonna do something really small. I'm just gonna do a, a small logo, fifty percent off. Yeah, that's got a little bit of play on that as well, but it just again does not make sense because that because um, how these other all those other ones work is you would be able to um, zoom in on it and it would basically blow up the picture or pixelate it a little bit if it's too small it'll say hey I'm I'm stretching the image because it's too small or something that's what I would expect for this to be able to get you know zoom it in or crop as as much as you want actually ironically I can move the back actually move the image on there. That's weird. I, so I don't know if they changed that where you can only do that a certain amount and then you actually have to move the image, but that doesn't make sense either. If you, cut it, if you cut it there, I wonder if it shows all white, like what the excess is. You mean like if I do that? 
Yeah, and you save it, and then you. Yeah, so let's do the full. And it, full and you thing do your here. main. Yep. Well, actually, is, not, can you get it's it? not white. It's actually transparent, but. You the listing. Oh, interesting. So, interesting. But uh, definitely, uh, definitely something I'll submit something in there. Hopefully, we can get an answer to that. But a good question. Yeah, so one quick question on the on the photos, if you have a second. The, sure. Um, I have a Facebook group that basically is how I started the directory. Right. Um, and what I'm doing is once they, people sign up, I post, you know, I, I give them a shout out on the Facebook group. And I noticed today that um, when I did the URL and pasted in there, the profile picture or their logo doesn't show up on the left, but it was only for one person that didn't show, didn't have their profile logo. They had their profile photo, didn't have their logo, so it was blank. In other words, it, it showed the, you know, it had a, a blank square instead of a logo that makes you understand what i'm saying so um no on when they're sharing on facebook it didn't have the logo but the other ones did yeah go to can you i don't know if you can get it real quick go to facebook real quick and then go to f y n d d a t m Oh, yeah, wait, you gotta go to groups. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, Group yeah. first. Yeah, but, well, yeah, is that your pay? Oh, yes. Yeah, groups, forward slash. Okay, so this is okay. just your joint page. You're asking why your joint page isn't there? Yes. Yeah, so, so, well, not that. Well, that's, yeah. Go down. Go down now. That's that's one of them. But go down a little. Go down to. Um, keep going down. Keep going a little bit. Yeah. Right there. See that? Right there. Triple. Three. See that? There's there's no logo there. But if you go down, or no image there. But if you go down to, when I did. Uh, let's see. I, I go down a little bit down and see one that for book it. Yeah. See that book it, and it shows. And what I noticed on his profile is that he had his profile photo but not profile logo i didn't know what it was grabbing if you knew what it was grabbing uh yeah so there's a there's an order that uh bd does of grabbing the content um and yeah, let me see if i can find it sorry like i didn't notice the joint page but i gotta figure out where that joint page one is too for my website yeah so However, let, me, let, me go, let me just go over that for everybody uh just so they can know how to find it if uh if, if you want to get find a particular website uh i just go to uh, visit you just hit visit your website for your particular uh directory and uh, once you do that, you should see a admin bar pop up on the left. And so um, what you wanna do for the, the actual uh, SEO uh, stuff here is um, right here. Uh, actually, no, let me go. Actually, hold on. Let me, get to, uh, let me get to the join page, for example. So you can kind of browse to whatever you wanna do and that page will show up uh, on there as a, uh, or the admin bar will follow you around normally. And so uh, what you want to do is um, go to edit this page, the little pencil icon there. And what that's going to do, that's going to open up that uh, that page. Uh, and then you, you can uh, check your SEO settings on that particular page. So oh, yeah. um, you'll, you'll notice right. here for the SEO meta tags and data, just that, that's where you want to um, have it. And then if you want a specific uh, yeah. image for that particular page, you can upload it. Um, most of the most of the actual other pages, uh, for example, um, if you go to the uh, search results for your particular directory, um, a lot of these pages, if there's if they're not a custom page, which all pages have their own 
uh, side, uh, you know, SEO settings that I just showed you there. Um, for any of the dynamically created pages, you're going to see these little carrots right here that uh, with, with that, and that is basically your SEO template for that dynamic page. And so if you click on that one, it's not going to actually open up the page to edit. It's going to open up your SEO templates. And so it kind of defaults in the content SEO templates. And this is where you go to change it. Now realize when you're changing these SEO templates, you're changing any page that is using that SEO template. So any dynamically created page um, that is using this particular one is going to be edited when you do that. So just realize if you upload a logo or you change something on the SEO settings here, it's going to affect multiple pages, potentially hundreds of links, right? Because it's using that SEO template. Just be aware of that. With each one of these SEO templates, same thing. There's going to be meta tags, um, social media share details on here, and there's going to be an image spot here as well that you can use as the default. Um, and you don't need to do that. Normally, it will default to the uh, the web page one uh, overall, but that's where that is to add a specific one uh, for that particular segment. And so if I just go back here to click on the SEO templates, there's actually 45, I believe, SEO templates. And um, yep, 45. And so there's 45 different instances types. Now there's multiple pages, like for this example, state and main category. Uh, where it says like Michigan and uh, Barber, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of these, uh, or actually any profession name, it's going to have any main categories. So if you have a thousand categories, uh, there's going to be a thousand pages that are affected by that. So, you suggest, uh, do you suggest doing every um, page and filling out the SEO stuff for everyone? Okay, say that again, Jimmy. Do you, do you suggest Going in individually into each web page or each um, template and going in and editing all of them. So there is well, I mean, SEO. If you want something specific, right? I mean, this all sets up as, as general default stuff. So, for example, let's go to a member's main category. If, if you go to edit there, there's BD is going to have um, uh, templates in there that you that you may want to edit. And um, mm -hmm. I actually, I'm actually not too concerned about the SQO in mine right now, and I haven't actually edited mine. So I'm actually going to just do this as a demo uh, of probably what not to do. Um, if, if I just go into uh, the view page source on here and I look at mine, it's going to it's gonna have some keywords in there, but it's not going to make total perfect sense. And I'll show you what I mean by that when I open it up. Because um, I'll come with what you notice. It, it has these percent percent signs in here. And that basically just means it's a, a variable. It's going to displace that depending on the page. So this is basically saying, hey, for the key, uh, the title, it's going to say uh, the profession name, right. find you know your industry news, reviews, and information. So if you want that on every page, maybe you don't want the industry. Uh, you don't like the you know this. It has some default stuff in uh, the template, and just realize it's probably it's yeah. different based on each uh, theme that you started out with. So. If you're in the real estate or the um, the membership group uh, theme that you used on the demo bootstrap or whatever you had them load initially or the all-in-one theme, these are some of the things that are kind of a little bit customized for that particular theme, and they're not going to be necessarily be the same. So if you picked a theme for based on the colors or something like that, maybe some of these are not always all exactly what you want to be. And so, um, you know, SDO is it, it, it grabs that in Google and uses it, and that's what people see on the Internet. And so um, I'd add it to my to-do list to go through every one of those SEOs and just make sure it kind of reads uh, correct. Uh, and obviously it, it, it'll take a while as you have 45 of them, but once you have it done, you're done. And then it, it replicates all these across there and it's always gonna read read correctly. So let me go back to mine uh, again for the, uh, there's my page stuff here. That was my search results. So hopefully that'll come up here in a second, but uh, just to kind of show you what it looks like. But you can tell um, usually if, if you're posting something to Facebook and it says like, um, you know, come visit professionals, professionals near you. We serve professionals. And you're like, that just, I guess it sounds weird. Like it maybe looks good for keywords potentially, but it just doesn't read well on a social media post. Then you probably want to change that. But that's, that's where you go in there to do that is in that SEO uh, me uh, meta tag settings. Yeah, I noticed they, um, they grab a, some of the text and it sometimes doubles the text if it's in there twice. 
Yeah, and, and exactly. Because they don't know, you know, when you're setting this up, you don't know what profession name is or whether you have that in the industry right. as well. So we could say uh, plumbers, uh, plumbers, plumber, yeah. plumber, plumbers, fine plumbers, you know, and you're right. like, that just doesn't sound right. So let me go back to yours real quick. Um, so this is one where you have uh, that picked it up fine because they've got the logo. And, uh, and now we can kind of see what uh, what Jamie was talking about, where that doesn't crop and it just looks like it's taking up the whole page. And that that's not the profile. It's supposed to be a nice yeah. um, header. That's one, of the the top. that's one of the small ones. Because <laughs> I'm in the event industry and people just load, uploading like, you know, large pictures. So. Yeah, they have like a a uh, infogram or a uh, info uh, thing that's taken up three three pages. I was trying to say that if there's a way of putting it, of moving that to the bottom because then it would kind of make everything a little bit more unison. But they said they don't have an uh, option for that. No, I'm you sure can't move that. I mean, well, I mean, not natively. I mean, you, you have to have somebody customize the code. But yeah, you can move that down. Yeah, it's yeah. just yeah. right. Yeah. So, so then, uh, so then Jamie was saying this one, uh, so this one does have a logo actually. No, no. Yeah. So, so that's I'm the one, sure. but that, that's, that, that's using the actual profile photo. Cause if I hear, I mean, uh, if I log in, is that, well, user? yeah, but that, that was the one that you said didn't, that one didn't have the logo here. Right. Oh, you did know, they not what, have did the logo? Just it? It? You know, he did. He just switched it for me. I asked him to switch. The, originally had it as a profile. Oh, wait, no, no, no. I'm sorry. That's the profile logo. The profile photo is missing. So I was yeah, wondering if that, if the other one was grabbing, if the, if the one on the social media was grabbing the profile photo for some reason. I don't know. I don't think so. It's, I it should do that, that logo. So there's well, a I hierarchy asked, of uh, social media posts. So I asked him to upload the... Um, same logo in the profile photo just to test it. So I'm waiting to do, to do that. But okay. let me ask another question. Do they, do but I even I, need I, to I have, don't, I don't have that on me. Let me give this out real quick, Jamie. There, there is an actual um, hierarchy of uh, social media posts and I'm just going to go to face uh, their, their group here real quick and kind of try to find it while I'm talking about it real quick here, but there's an actual hierarchy and they've got it on here of, of what it is. Um, I think it's just hierarchy is what I had looked up, but I probably hey, that Brian, while you're looking for that, uh, you want me to chime in a second here? Because I, I, yeah, uh, yeah. I, think, I think we talked about it last week. I just can't remember. So, go ahead. Um, so, Jamie, I um, I put the a link, the debugger link in the chat. Um, if you're sharing a link, on the, it, it, it's gotten really ornery the last month or so. If you're sharing a new link on your Facebook page that Facebook has never had shared on Facebook before, their computer, their um, their bots now are really lazy and looking for a graphic. So what I would encourage you to do is go to that debugger link before you post any link on your Facebook page and always put it in that debugger link. Um, scrape it a couple times and get what you want out of it. And then, then that basically forces the Facebook engine to see a link and say, okay, now I know what you want to see in it. So once you see what's there, because it, well, I just went through and I scrubbed it, a, I scraped it a couple times, and that um, that logo did show up in the square. But it's just, it, it's a function of Facebook spots getting a little lazy because they don't want to waste milliseconds looking deeper for an image. So they, if they don't see one first off, they they won't post it with it. So. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of use that, use that link to always re, um, you know, pre preview links that you post on your Facebook page and you should be pretty good. So yeah, you what's strange hit, is the new hit scrape the again. There, Ryan. Was that okay. hit scrape again? Yeah, no, I'm just looking at, um, so, so to what Scott is saying is that this is, this has already been scraped. So this is the original one that you had done so what he's saying is put it in there first make sure this looks good and you're like yep that looks good and then post because what this is doing it although he has already adapted and, and added a logo because it scraped it a while ago um it's it's still showing improper so what you want to do to try to get the logo back in there you kind of have to force it and go hey scrape that again but it says eight minutes ago so i don't know unless they just did it so yeah, from, from, from and some of them which strange is the new face so i have to switch back and forth from the new to the old because the the new facebook group posts 
or act a little bit different than the the old the, or the one that's I guess old now, but when Ryan, the, uh, that's the really old weird. version. Of because I'm on that debugger right now too, and I'm scraping the same link, and I'm seeing the yeah. logo, not the not the, um, the image image. <laughs> Facebook. Sometimes. Well, I'm on the. It's a, so J to Jamie, I'm on the new one. I'm on the new Facebook uh, uh, view. So um, maybe I don't know. Maybe we found another bug. Like, is there something in the code maybe that that the new one doesn't like the way that they're pushing stuff from BD? No, the old one. No, because no, some of them some of them do show up. Um, okay. But what's but but what's different is though that when you. I, I use the the group a lot to um, to post stuff and with on the new one when you actually add a post the way that it's grabbing the the text is different than the old where it had the head you know it had a head one h1 and h2 and mm -hmm. then in the groups and then it had so it's totally different it doesn't have the h1 and h2 and it it just formats it different so I go back and forth so that I can format them the way I like them from the old because what happens is if you want them all bold or larger font, you can't get it with the new one. You can only get a certain amount of text with the new format they have. It's strange. It's just, I, they changed so much, I can't figure them out. So actually that's gonna come uh, come right into uh, kind of what we're talking about today, uh, to be honest, uh, of a service that you can actually uh, um, change your URL of what image and how you may want it to look. And so when you post it to the social media using that, the link that you provide it, um, it actually kind of pushes exactly what you want to uh, the different services. Uh, so there's some actual, I don't know if it's a, a shortcoming that uh, some of the others, these services are no noticing or whatever, but uh, just kind of uh, forcing it um, and, and setting it up uh, as opposed to just letting it figure out or do its own thing. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's probably a, a bigger issue for a lot of different people, but so I just, I just find it weird though that um, Scott, you're, you're saying you see an image right here and I'm not. So yeah, that is, <clears throat> and I don't know. I'm actually, I'm actually on. Oh no, I'm, I'm on Firefox on that. Um, where I see it, I wonder. You know, I wonder if it's a Chrome issue. Let me uh, open this debugger. Uh, there was a bug. The there's a bug the other day with Grammarly that. And I was I don't, using my phone. Grammarly like, affected everything, but I don't, I don't have that. It would no. The Grammarly was was affecting pop-ups on the back end of BD, and I went into fire. I went into like uh, the Edge or whatever the new Microsoft is, and it worked fine. And then I went at home and used my old computer. It worked fine on Chrome. Like I was going crazy. I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, they eventually said, "Oh, they figured out there was a bug in Grammarly with the or with how the Grammarly was affecting the pop-ups." They fixed it, I guess. Well, Grammarly, that's like their their go go to uh, um, item is that Grammarly uh, messes everything up. <laughs> yeah, messes everything up. No, it's not the browser. I'm seeing the logo on uh, Chrome and on Firefox. That's weird. Let me scrape. Let me go to mine. You're saying go here. I can put the URL in. Okay. Now it's working on mine or on uh, yeah, Firefox. But that is frustrating, though. Obviously, you don't want to be um, thinking it's not loading when it's loading for maybe everybody else, but not loading for you. But um, that is just weird. Yeah, I just, I just debugged mine and I, I don't see the logo. Oh, you don't? No, nope, but I'm going to scrape it again. Let's see what happens. Nothing. Well, you know, I don't, I don't run this one. Oh yeah, see, I got the same thing you have. The more the more time Facebook spends trying to be big for small business, the bigger they get, and the more they lose touch with small business. <laughs> I know. It's well, like, there's no way like Microsoft when they're they're like they're, they're focused on they just add too much stuff in there, and then you, you just can't you actually use it anymore. I'm surprised you can't make any money off your groups. You can't even do put put ads on your you know, the group pages. That's I got 6,600 B2B, B, B, you know, businesses on the group. And I had, you know, obviously the, I was always going to create a directory eventually, but for four years I w didn't take any money in. 
now that you want to, you can't, right? <laughs> well, I believe you can create, you can, uh, you can convert the public group to a page. If once you convert it to a page, you can run ads on it or you can, you know, you can, um, you can do a little bit more with it. Is it a closed group or a, a private or open? It's public. But wait, it, you say you can convert the group to a page? I believe so. Uh, the problem with I don't the pages, know though, is that... Because I, I had somebody the other day, and I don't know if they changed this, like they tried to change it around like that, and it, it basically told them that they had to delete it and make a new group to use that name as a page device a group or, or so, it was something to that effect. They actually legitimately just had to close it to then reopen it as a page or something. So it got rid of everything, you know. Yeah, that's tricky though. When it, cause sometimes you can close a group or a page and when you give up that name and then you try and yeah. it, it tells you it's not available. Yeah, that might, yeah. that might be the challenge is that because groups have a different uh, uh, canonical, canonical. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But they, they are pushing URL. people to, to open up all their closed groups, though. They want everything non-private. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Sorry. Excuse my language. Well, the, the, the problem with the page is that there's no interaction between – there's not instant interaction. So the group is is better for getting people to interact because the pages are just kind of more – Yeah, better. you're right about that. If you, if yeah, you they want, all the group stuff that go into their feed now. So, like, uh, that's really when you get messaged and pinged is when, you know, something gets added to the group. I uh, just post. So what I don't understand about that whole thing is should you have a page and a group or does it depend yes. on what you're doing? Yeah, you should have both. I mean, I have both. I mean, because you can't – one thing with the groups is you can't, you can't post group um, – like, you can't take your um, – group and have a, a widget on anywhere they don't allow they don't give the apis or whatever the hell it is to the so you can do it on a, on a group i mean on a page but you can't do it with a group and so don't you have to have a group attached to a page oh, i guess you don't i, I thought you no know, just to your it, to your individual you need an individual um it ha, it, you have to have an account and then you can do as many well, groups you have as you to want. have a group a page before you can have a group no they're independent but I think you attach I, groups to a page. You like if you have a page, yeah, you, 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 like you have any groups, and then you can attach you it can on attach there. To a page. The the um, I mean, I suggest anybody that if anybody was going to do a directory, is to start a group, you know, ahead of time, and getting the uh, you know, getting people and you know interested in it. Yeah, I'm actually, and just I uh, just uh, floating this out there for everybody. I'm actually going to eventually uh, when I. When I get around to it, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to launch a group uh, off uh, off Facebook, I think. Um, and what I'm going to do, oh, let me share my screen real quick. Um, I'm going to use uh, uh, Tribe is what I'm going to use. So it's basically a uh, it's basically a forum or a community platform that you can integrate into your products. It's kind of the same type of stuff where people ask questions. Uh, they can, you know, do all the normal um, stuff uh, as a group and ask questions and do polls and, and, and everything. It's just, it's just your own, uh, you own the information and it's on your domain. Um, and it's just, it's your community for your niche as opposed to uh, Facebook. So yeah. you that when you get some time. Yeah, when I get some time. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you my forwarding address in hell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh anyway, so it's got uh it's got different uh, widgets and uh and stuff you can uh, embed in there and uh, just do different stuff on the platform. But that's <laughs> good. One of the things I was gonna do when I designed they had the idea of the 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 direct it was the directory plus some other stuff that I'm gonna hopefully be able to do. There's so much interaction with the the um, when when the event industry is back in again. We were we're probably closed till next year, but when um, people interact and are looking for stuff, they do, they you know they go to a Facebook group and they go I'm looking for a red chair and then you know hundreds of people you know say yep. hey these they have the red chair they have the red chair, but if I wanted to you know I had a guy that was gonna look at doing on on the app for me and the problem is is that they don't facebook doesn't give you the the api on the groups because it's because they have to have 
everybody that's on the group, they need their um, permission. So it's a whole weird permission thing. Well, the, the one cool thing about this one, it still has the activity feeds, uh, comments and, and sharing and stuff like that. Um, but you, it also has, um, it also has, uh, integration. So, um, let me, let me try to find that stuff. Uh, real I think quick. It's awesome. What was that? I said, it's awesome to, that they do that. The only hard part is, is getting people off of Facebook. <laughs> well, I would get rid of Facebook if I could. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the sense of that. That's because you, know, you no matter what you tell me, they go, Oh, I just want to do Facebook. Leave me alone. You know, right. It's, it's crazy. So I gotta somehow figure out a way of integrating the well. So here's the, here's the alert on that. It's got the social login, so you can actually log in with Facebook. It actually integrates with Messenger, so they actually receive the community notifications on their Messenger when they interact or send stuff back and forth. Um, or or Slack. Uh, if they're using that, um, and it also has Telegram, so um, so it, it can basically plug into all those. So whether they're using Telegram or their uh, their Messenger, they actually get the notifications from your uh, your niche community. On their, they log in with Facebook, they get the comments in their mess. So it's it's kind of like using Facebook, only it's on your, yours. It's just kind of tying in there. So if, if Facebook goes away or you get sick of it, then they just don't use Messenger. They kind of either either use your group or use Slack or telegram or but it's not it's not limiting you to a particular uh platform but um and then it also has its own private messaging um platform as well okay i even tried scraping uh the fact you can't even scrape a facebook group to get email addresses no about the about the best thing you can do on a facebook group is ask them for their email on the sign up question yeah. and then have one of those soft software things that integrates into facebook that grabs that uh question response and then adds that into a autoresponder or something into your own database so that's yeah, which one, when i figured out wasn't there that's what i did i basically uh, what was it? i thought there was, what ryan wasn't there an AppSumo product recently that did that um no there was some other uh some other ones that were offline offline that yeah did those. i saw it but i passed on that yeah i mean unless you're doing you gotta have you gotta have it set up exactly right um and you gotta use facebook all the time and ask my question and have enough flow to get that right. uh, email addresses but yeah, I, I finally after you know three and a half years figured out that i should ask them for their email address right and what i do is i approve everybody so I copy and paste the email address every time before I approve them. Um, it's a pain in the butt, yeah, but so, yeah. Just so everybody watching, just if you don't realize those those kind of go away after you approve those, unless you have something, uh, some sort of system yeah. to capture it. You know where to find them. Yeah. And you know, what, what doesn't make any sense though is that I thought that it forced people to answer the questions, and it doesn't. E even the privacy policy or the yeah no it just it just then your prerogative to go well they didn't answer my question so i'm not letting them in the group but at that point you know a lot a lot of people aren't just going to deny they want the membership group they're just doing the the closed off uh, group of the questions just to try to get some marketing information right yeah i just basically messaged the person i said if you want to be accepted i need your email address and then they either answer me or not right what kind of a percentage okay. do you get i get it pretty good because uh, well, I get a pretty, I get a uh, probably about an 80% response rate because mine are all B2B. It's not really a, to the, I'm not, I didn't open it to the public yet in a sense of advertising. So I have like 60, 600 event professionals that are, you know, either working or not working right now, but either with companies or independent planners. Um, I just need to get a proof of concept. And I, so it just kind of grew organically. And, um, but like thousands of companies are doing business, you know, inside it by referring people. So now I finally, you know, found the, this platform that I could develop myself instead of hiring a developer to develop the whole idea. And then, um, now I'm finally having people sign up. However, COVID closed, you know, 90% of the event business is, is done right now until probably mid next year. Are you guys switching to any type of uh, online event stuff uh, with uh, different event streaming software or well, I, set up? Or? I own, I own a, um, a rental company and we can't go virtual because I have products. So I, I rent okay. bars. But but there is a lot of my clients who 
tons of my clients are going virtual. I mean, there's everything from virtual caricature stuff to real giant, you know, meetings that I have a client that does, you know, huge virtual stuff. So the problem is, is like everybody's trying to pivot that direction because, you know, Zoom came out and but Zoom is crap for that. They use, you know, bigger platforms. However, um, you know, when you have like tons of people now trying to pivot to there, it gets, you know, washed up in the market. So, right. but um, until live events come back, concerts and, you know, I, I'm, I was lucky that the Super Bowl happened before COVID because I did a lot of work at the Super Bowl. Um, otherwise, I'd be washing cars right now. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of, uh, I guess, washing cars and needing to uh, uh, save all your money, um, uh, th- what we're going to talk about today, I was going to transition to the presentation since we're, we're a little bit into the into the show here. Um, the uh, I want to talk about today is uh, just some uh, uh, return on investment uh, tracking systems for success for your directories uh, that can help you be more efficient uh, with your advertising money uh, once you get to that point, uh, and some systems on how to do that using uh, UTMs, uh, and we'll get to what that is when you say, for those of you who don't know what that is, I'll explain that, and then just kind of talk some marketing short links and some potential ways that you guys can use that for your directory. So just uh, in kicking off this topic, uh, just, a, just a little background history. You know, before 2005, um, when you when you were calculating return on investment for your marketing uh, campaigns, it was all guesswork uh, and approximations, right? The internet was fairly new. Nobody really knew. They were paying money for ads, didn't know where the money was going. And then Google re- released their, uh, their big money maker, which I think everybody knows now, which was not so common then, but is common to everybody now, is Google AdWords. And they basically, you know, forever changed that marketing and advertising as we know it on the internet. And it's kind of the staple uh, advertising ones. Obviously, there's other niche uh, directories, and Scott could probably talk about that the stuff that he does. But um, th- you know, AdWords is the big, uh, big ticket in town, or the big, uh, the kahuna on that. And then when they released that, they actually, you know, they released their conversion tracking ability for those AdWords, and so. Uh, marketers and business owners could basically uh, pay for those online advertisements and know the exact cost of each ad click and and then know whether or not that particular ad click resulted in a sale. And so when that happened, when they introduced AdWords and that conversion tracking ability, it was revolutionary, right, at that time um, because you were able to track the, the dollar you spend to the dollar you make and make wise business decisions. And so I'm not talking about AdWords today uh, as the, the revolutionary topic of concern for today. What, what I'm talking about is the general concept of digital attribution, how, how you're spending your money, uh, your, your ad or your uh, time and effort in uh, developing and advertising or promoting your directory and how that results and attributes to any money that you make. And so I think anybody can admit that that is something that they would want to do or should do. And so the question is how. Um, So AdWords basically gave us an accurate baseline to experiment from. Um, And, you know, if you spent X and made Y, then you could expand that from a baseline and scale your advertising. Right. So um, if if you were if you're losing money, you never want to do that advertising again. But if, if you were making a little bit of money, even a little bit scaled up becomes a lot of money. And so depending on how your setup was, you could make wise business decisions. And so that introduced the ability to track that ROI uh, accurately. And so the question is, why don't we do the same thing for online marketing activities that you do for your directory? I mean, what about blogging, you know, display ads, uh, webinars, email marketing? All these things are digital. Um, Is that possible to do that same thing, that ROI assessment and decision making, do it for everything else that you do for your directory and promoting it? And the answer is yes. And so today I'm going to show you how to discover, you know, what you need to know to track most of your online marketing activities and basically, uh, you know, hopefully rule your niche that you're in by using those those different metrics. And then I'm also going to look at how you can apply that approach to, you know, a variety of marketing channels and then how you can use those different tools uh, to derive insights from your data. I'm not going to go into the, the data or number crunching and we're going to just be going over how this works. But, you know, once you're done doing that and if you execute, um, and you use that data that this provides, you're, you're, you, you'll be able to calculate that ROI for your online marketing campaigns with precision um, so that you can you know, double down on your wins and then and quickly cut your losses. And I think that's what everybody wants to do in terms of these uh, the money opportunities on the internet. 
Oops. So, um, so what I want to talk about is UTM today, and everybody's saying, "What is a UTM?" And basically, UTM are basically parameters. Uh, uh, is an established system that allows you to track your marketing campaigns uniformly across across more most analytics tools. And uh, UTMs are basically the way you know that the true return on investment of your online marketing activities. So if you do some sort of business online, uh, you kind of have no choice to use them. Um, you don't have to use them, but if you don't, a lot of times you're not going to actually know what you're spending your money on, uh, whether that's wasted or was profitable for you. So UTMs are the way to universally track it. And what it basically is, is I would just compare it to any government standard where you have... Um, exact dimensions of something like all the threads right on on certain uh uh bolts are all the same you know width or whatever so when you get a bolt and a nut they all fit right or standards of of sizes of tires right your your rim tire they're all the same so if you have if you buy a tire and it's a certain rim size it's going to fit um those are probably, there are probably some better examples of standards but everybody gets the point that if once you have standardization and all these systems and tools use that you can gain some uh some insights you're not have a funneled uh, process that only works on one particular uh, system uh, and doesn't work on the other one. The UTMs are basically that standard uh, uh, across the board. And uh, uh, Frank asked me that a little bit ago. He's like, "What is UTM?" It's actually uh, that actually stands for. Um, let me let me get this right so I don't mess this up on that. Um, it's actually urchin tracking modules. What that stands for, it kind of doesn't really matter now. Urchin is one of those big uh, analytics uh, companies of the past that got eaten up by Google. But because Google bought them out uh, when they started uh, releasing their Google Analytics, this is the system that they used to start tracking all these different parameters. And because it became the standard, and you can add it to any other URLs for other other systems, it just became the standard. And and then all the systems are starting to use that. But the only way that you can use them is if you actually um, have those uh, turned on or use those in your links. And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about the different components of those today and then how you can use them. So um, what I want to talk about or why, why use UTMs is because it allows you to focus uh, what matters uh, instead of doing vanity metrics. And you can kind of see a man, man, uh, vanity metrics in the background cartoon here. Um, and vanity metrics are basically those things you you can measure but don't really matter. Um, for ex example, like uh, email opens. I've had this many email opens or I've had this many Facebook likes. Um, it looks good on paper, right? But they're data points that that appear positive but are but can either be easily changed or manipulated uh, or they don't have an actual direct correlation with numbers that speak to business success, right? Just because you have a lot of email opens, or uh, Facebook likes does not mean that you actually sold anything or made any money. And so they really don't matter. They're just vanity metrics. And so there's a lot of marketers in charge of email marketing campaigns, you know, say like, hey, I got a you know 22% open rate or I got a 43% click-through rate and I did pretty good on that. But the reality is unless they clicked on the email and purchased something, um, it doesn't really matter. And so if you can't connect those email clicks back to actual purchases, um, then you should be concerned about that because it's just a vanity metric. It doesn't mean anything to you. You can't do any actionable item or information off from that. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to make sure you're using the UTMs in order to measure actual important business metric, you know, so you actually know your return on the investment uh, for, um, for your actual uh, thing. I'm going to turn off everybody's mics here just so I don't get any background. All right. So hopefully that makes sense uh, makes sense for everybody. But it, basically, the, the UTM gets you actionable data that you can use to make uh, smart business decisions. So um, before we get into the UTMs, obviously when we're talking we're talking money, we're just going to go over a little bit of financial stuff. And this is a, a mostly obvious for everybody. I just want to kind of detail it for everybody on why uh, how you make these decisions is that the cost normally for content, what you do for your directory or some other line stuff is basically broken down into two, two parts. It's the, the cost of content creation and then the cost of distribution. So think about it, when you're, right, when you're doing content for your directory, you know, the most basic cost of, of content marketing is creating it. So whether, whether you've outsourced a job or do different things in-house for your, your directory, your company, there's always a cost attached to it, right? 
I mean, without sourcing, it's basically the fees that you pay to a third party agency uh, for in-house, um, you know, time is money. So if you're spending time doing it, it's not, you're not doing something else to make money or you're paying somebody uh, internal to the company or even yourself, I guess on paper uh, uh, in order to do it because time is money. So it's either time lost for you or other activities or your employees time you have to pay for. Um, or obviously billing time that you're going to have to charge to your agency clients and, and it's costing them money. So bottom line, time is money. And I think we all know that. Um, you know, so you have to think about how much that time is really costing you really. I mean, if you're a so solopreneur and you're, uh, you know, you're just writing your blog instead of watching TV, then maybe the cost is zero. Uh, but really, um, it's never a co cost of zero. There's always a trade off. Um, you know, so if you need to do that um, and see how much money you're, or time you're, you're focusing on that human capital that you're doing that, it's going to cost you some efficiency um, or other money or time. And it's just that simple. So um, if you're, you know, billable hours or the amount of money or time that you're wasting that at, on that is greater than what you're actually getting in, you're going to be uh, losing money. And the other part of uh, that is the cost of distribution. And so obviously just producing high quality content. So for example, um, we talked about making the graphics last week. So just because you have really good graphics, um, that seldom brings you traffic and customers. You have to distribute that content, right? Put it in the right areas, get, get somebody to pay to put it somewhere, get it in front of your target audience. And so that distribution of, co of content has costs with it as well. So some of the distribution channels, you know, maybe are social media advertising or pay-per-click ads, whatever it is, um, you're, you're going to have some sort of cost for that distribution. So those two things, the cost of creation and the cost of distribution are two of the things that you have to think about for cost. And so on the other end of the spectrum is the, the return on investment uh, calculation is how much you're actually getting back in revenue. And so what you see on the screen here um, is just an equation for that. But the next step uh, towards finding your, your you know, return on investment is to ca calculate that revenue. And so once you've posted your content and you, you need to find out the number of leads it's generating, and if any, the number of purchases based off from that, otherwise it's just a total guess. And so this is a quick math example on here. If you spend $100,000 and you make $300,000, you can calculate with relative ease that you've made $200,000, right? That's the top of the equation. Um, and then if you divide it by the number of the amount you spent again, that's your, your percentage. So you, um, so in this example, you, you made 200,000, but you spent $100,000 to do it. You made a 200% return on investment. And so knowing that ROI is good, but, um, the real the real problem with that is it's not easy to tell what got you that two percent, especially um, if you're doing it in a bunch of different multi channels like you would normally see in today's online marketing world. And so Internet marketing, which I think everybody knows, here's not that cut and dry. Right. Content marketing is much more complicated. Um, it can make it difficult and, and, and to clear and not very clear to establish that relationship between your sales and content. Because when you're looking at this graph here, you're doing your internet marketing, which one of these bubbles gave you that $300,000 um, amount? Which one of these you know, bubbles was the largest part of the 100,000 that you spent? Um, it's not that easy. And so you can't just bundle everything into one neat figure. You know, with the, with the online marketing we have now, we have to be able to prove a return on investment for each one of those individual channels. I mean, if you're spending hundred dollars across three different marketing channels and you're generating two hundred dollars, you know it doesn't mean that all marketing channels are giving you a positive ROI. Maybe the SEO is the only one that's positive. Everything else is negative and dragging you down. You shouldn't even do those. Maybe you just focus on the SEO part of the internet marketing. So um, it could be just that one of them is dramatically over delivering while the rest of them are losing you money. And, and that's the point. You want to know which one of those are. But unless you have a way or a, a, of using, uh, figuring out which ones are, are paying off the UTMs using those, there's no way to tell where your marketing spend or where your income is coming from. And so that is where it, uh, where it uh, comes into play. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, if you look at it, here's another way to look at it for internet marketing. It, instead of the bubbles of activities, here's here's the different things that we always do all the time or we spend time making or we um, spend money paying for, um, you know, whether it be educating by making infographics or guides, whether we're doing entertainment by making a video. We have, if we're paying somebody, a, a, you know, an endorsement or somebody um, that has some followers to post something for us or whether we're trying to convince them through checklists or case studies or just on, online demos. Um, you know, all of these are activities or marketing efforts um, that we're pushing to other people as taking time and money to execute um, what 
return on investment are you getting for those particular items? Which one of those items that people are looking at? Um, is it the celebrity endorsement that's getting you the sale? Is it your ebook that you made? Maybe maybe the webinar that you you pushed out that uh, people watched that then went to your site and bought. Like how how are you making the money? Which is the initial lead for getting the money? And that is what you want to try to figure out is which one of these efforts is is worth it. Um, and then this is just the last thing to just kind of reiterate again that, the, you know, when normally when people look at a traditional sales funnel and they talk about it, this is kind of what they all brief and it sounds good. Hey, first you have awareness and then they consider, they evaluate your product and then they purchase and then, then you make money and you know uh, where they fit in any one of these, whether that made you the money or not. This is a nice, neat funnel. Well, depending on if you set these funnel pages up or uh, the reality is it probably looks more like this for the sales journey where um, maybe they, um, you know, despite the most funnel page layouts and a linear progression, you know, the new sales journey can start with a peer referral on, you know, social media. Uh, and then they go verify with other online comments. And then that leads them to an online search uh, to a competition comparison site, maybe, or maybe even your competition or you, and they kind of compare that maybe a system that has third party reviews and then that then they eventually go to your site and then they make a sales call off from that and contact you and buy something. So it's not necessarily a, a linear process anymore with the Internet and digital stuff. And especially when you're doing all those different online marketing things, it probably looks more like this where the, the path from a prospect to a customer is not a straight line. They're kind of back and forth and looking at different things along the And it's not it's not linear like you, we'd hope to see for a us you know, just a, a sales page for it, for a product. It doesn't look like that. It probably looks more like that. So the more it looks like that, the more complicated it could be to make a decision. Um, and so um, most of us, so it comes kind of comes down to the analytics and most of us probably use the Google analytics, but, um, and it works great for AdSense, but you know, what about other traffic sources? What about these other uh, systems? Um, and we, what ends up happening is everybody uses different analytics tools um, for their particular niche. Um, that tells them other information. Uh, but unless you're using that same link structure in order to get the same data in multiple systems, whichever system you're paying to use, you're going to be seeing disparate data, uh, things that don't line up. And what ends up happening is you, you make uh, uh, wrong assumptions or information based off from data that's maybe not accurate because you're only looking at, uh, you're not looking at congruent data that's been, I guess, systematically, um, you know, being tagged at, with the same information in order to make those kind of decisions. So the real goal is to have a tracking model that works with all marketing channels and all uh, analytics tools. And, and that's why we come full circle back to the UTMs. And so bottom line is that UTM is simply an, en an encoded back end of a link that uh, you append to the URL. So it'd be www.yourdirectory.com. Uh, backslash, and then whatever that page is, it has some additional data appended to that URL. Uh, and it can be, uh, you know, pretty long and made up with a, a lot of different parameters, but each parameter basically provides uh, specific information about the link in question. And then basically by stringing those parameters together, you can track your online campaigns with a tremendous amount of detail and granularity and, and go back and make decisions based off from those. So I just want to kind of show you what it looks like in an example, a demo one uh, from my site. Um, this is what it would look like on the side here with all the different strings uh, attached to it. Instead of just saying directorytoolkit.com, you actually add all these different UTM parameters onto the link. And so just by them sharing that link or sharing that URL, you now have a bunch of rich information that you can parse through later and make concrete decisions for your business. So these UTMs have six different things just by default in there that has the URL and that's your main website. And it has the campaign source, the campaign medium, the campaign name, uh, the campaign content, uh, and then the campaign term. And we're going to go through uh, each one of these to kind of show you exactly what it does. So the first one is the uh, UTM source. And so this basically tells you the traffic source. It's basically the refer of the traffic to your page. So basically the website or platform or tool that you posted your link on. And so it's basically the traffic source sending the clicks to your directory. So if, uh, if it was a link on Google, you'd put Google. If it was a uh, referring website and you were giving somebody a link uh, for an affiliate, it would have that affiliate uh, website name on there. It's basically where are they coming from in order to do that. So obviously you can look at this button and make sense when you see a source, 
you can see whether all the links from Google were the ones that were paying off, or maybe it was Facebook or Instagram, uh, et cetera. Maybe it was your Send Fox newsletter. You can see the source that is basically making you all the money. So that's the traffic source, and that's the first one. And the second uh, parameter is the type of link uh, or traffic. So this is, in essence, is how the person got to the website in question or what medium the link was presented to them. So let's say you're spending money on a, a CPC uh, cost per click campaign um, uh, or email ad or something else like that, or you're, or you're focusing solely on Twitter. And, and so you're only doing tweets. It's the medium, basically how they click that. So not only do I know that I got the traffic maybe from Google, but I know that a, a, uh, the, the CPC click call from Google, as opposed to a, a, just a normal link, uh, uh, is where I got that, that traffic from. So it's the medium, basically the type of traffic, uh, that you are getting. The third one is, uh, the goal or marketing focus, and this is basically the campaign. So uh, this would generally refer to an overall marketing focus for that day, week, month, season, whatever have you. It's basically a nomenclature, um, you know, normally from traditional marketing in terms of campaigns. Like I'm doing a seasonal sale, so it's spring sale or summer sale. Um, it's maybe a launch campaign, so I want to say launch, or maybe it's a con all you label all your content marketing online just generically as content marketing, so you can kind of know that hey, everything I'm doing uh, online for social media posting uh, is getting me the traffic. You can kind of break it down that way. Could be an event, a feature product, you get the idea, but it basically uh, it basically groups everything under that one ca campaign. So when you're looking at it in the Google Analytics, um, you, it's basically grouped by that campaign and you can kind of know and parse it down and, and go from there. So that is the campaign. Um, the fourth one is a specific content. So this would be um, the type if you're sending out multiple emails for that campaign, let's say it's the summer sale and you're sending out multiple emails, um, you can actually um, put what uh, what type of uh, content uh, or where that's coming from. So you could do um, you know, content A and content B, or you could actually label the specific links inside of the email. So maybe it was a logo link or the buy now button. Um, and so you can kind of start to tell that nobody is clicking on the text links inside the emails everybody is clicking the buy now button. So I'm not, I'm going to focus and not put links, text links in there. I'm going to focus and add more buttons for uh, just as an example, or maybe there's an ad inside of a, a page campaign and everybody's clicking on the banner ad as opposed to the buy now button. So um, this basically gets you to, to specifically know which link on a page or on an, in an email is actually providing the sale. And then the, 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 the next one, uh, the final general one is uh, the term or keyword. And so this is basically used for specific advertising campaigns. So namely the Google AdWords campaign. So when somebody clicks on an ad and uh, this link is uh, for a specific keyword, uh, you now know that that keyword uh, was the one that made the sale. So maybe um, your spring sale did not do anything, but maybe the free trial uh, keyword is what everybody was clicking on because they, they didn't care about the sale. They wanted, they were clicking on the word free. So this just helps you to know which, which keyword to focus on for, for subsequent campaigns. And then some of them have actual custom uh, ones where you can add your own. So it's kind of like a free for all. Maybe there's a combination of the other ones that uh, will work better for you. Uh, or there's just something else that is a, a grouping that you would want to go look at later. And that some of these systems actually allow you to do customization on there. So just as a quick review, this is kind of what it looks like. It's a big long URL. Um, but it, it, by having all these in here, I now know if I get a purchase from here, it was a Google email um, that was done on, e on Google uh, for my launch campaign uh, where I talked about webinars as my keyword or uh, webinar is how I, uh, um, you know, uh, pushed out that link. Uh, to Google, and then I use the the search term UTMs. So by putting all those in there, you can get uh, the the big long uh, list uh, in the URL. Um, and so obviously, when you have that long of a of a URL, um, a lot of times you don't want to actually show that big long URL. You want it to just show up. Uh, obviously, directorytoolkit.com is a lot cleaner and looks a lot nicer than uh, that big long thing I gave you. So normally on these kind of services, when you have that set up, you wanna shorten the URL so it looks uh, a little bit uh, more decent. And so um, I also recommend basically hiding that UTM data and making links neater. And this is uh, a lot common one is Bitly where people can shorten the URLs, but the, there's a couple reasons why you wanna do that. Obviously 
the first one is links that use those UTM cones can look pretty messy. Uh, if you can shorten it back up to uh, something shorter that looks nice, yet still retain all of the data that are in that UTM, that's what you want to do. The second thing is UTMs also reveal a lot of information about your marketing, right? It lets other people know exactly what keywords you're looking at, maybe what uh, mediums you're focused on, kind of reveals a lot about your marketing data. Maybe you don't want that uh, open for all your competitors. So it kind of it keeps that a little bit secret as well. And then the third thing is, and is obviously a big one, is some customers also can be wary of those links that are long and complicated. So if they see a big, long uh, thing on there, they almost think that there's some sort of uh, spam or some sort of thing embedded in there or something that... Uh, is something nefarious, something weird that they don't want to click on. So shortening it up can actually lead to increased conversion leads and, and clicks just because it doesn't look weird. And so over to the left there, you can kind of see some examples of uh, the ones that I use for my domains. Um, I always, uh, this is a matter of fact, when I do a kind of a branding effort, I buy a shortened URL uh, and there's a new... Uh, um, URL of the dot link that is now available that I think works good for this purpose. So for example, for my directory toolkit.com, uh, if I add all these UTM parameters in there, I'm not going to add that big one in there. It's going to be uh, dir dot link and then forward slash like a uh, A252 or something like that. It usually puts a, um, a hex or I don't know what that would be called, a letter and number combination after the, uh, the link, but keeps it fairly short. Um, and then that's what you would post on social media or inside of your systems uh, to uh, to give those links. Um, and so I always recommend uh, if you guys are gonna use these uh, parameters to be able to search for them later, uh, get it, get some sort of uh, shortened URL. Um, and then when we talk about the software, um, I think we're gonna do that next week because uh, there's a bunch of different variations on that. Um, you'll be able to to use those links as, uh, as part of the software where you add those in there. Does this only work with Google? Or does it work with, or I mean, only no. with uh, Chrome? Or doesn't is a browser not browser specific? Um, no, it's not. It's not a Chrome thing. It's a Google thing. So it's basically a standard oh, okay. that right. that's used by other uh, other com other software. So for example, okay. if you use I had Kiss Metrics on there. So if you use that that metric uh, program or any other program, it's going to parse out or use that data because that's the stand that's the the I guess the internet standard. I, I would equate it to uh, I would equate it to like browser mm -hmm. um, requirements, right? Like uh, every browser has. Um, rendering requirements that doesn't matter if it's Firefox or Chrome, for the most part, um, they're standards and they all look the same on um, different browsers because it's using the, the standard. And so these UTM parameters are, a, a, I guess, an analytical standard that uh, was originated and founded by Google, but then kind of grabbed and used uh, for any of those other analytic uh, companies or softwares that, that you're using in order to uh, to get it. Um, and then, no and what then the other doing. reason too no is matter. obviously it's 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 done by Google. So if you're the most common one that everybody uses because it's free and has some great data is Google Analytics, and so that's what it that uses. So even if you don't want to pay for anything else or don't have anything else that uses these, um, Google will use it um, at the very least, and it'll provide you with some data. So here's a couple different companies uh, that we'll go over. Um, or here's the free one. Sorry, this is I basically how. So the question is how. How do you get those UTMs um, set up without having to fat finger it in or figure it out right? So uh, again, surprise, surprise, Google Analytics has a, a campaign URL builder. Uh, there's the website right there. Uh, you can just type in uh, uh, Google UTM. I think it'll come up. It basically, you basically provide the the, the website URL the, and you just hand type in all the source, medium name, term, and content. And then it just makes that big long URL for you. So you don't have to like uh, actually do all the question marks and forward slashes and all that stuff. It'll just make it for you. Um, so that's a free, uh, free one that does it for you. Uh, but the thing about this one is, although it's free, um, you can't, it's not, and it's easy to use. You can't, you don't get to archive any of that. You can't store them for later. So the, what ends up happening is sometimes you, you accidentally change the medium name or you, you spell the term differently or you can't use that later. You kind of have to have your own database or spreadsheet to go remember what you used in the past. And it's not very user friendly. It's kind of a one and done thing. So that um, there's actually other software that, that can help you out and add additional functionality 
um, like exchanging the images and some other stuff, which we'll talk about next week. But um, here's some here's here's the four um, services that uh, I'm going to touch base on next week, uh, just real quick. Um, and you guys can uh, look these up or uh, come with questions next week if you're actually curious about any of these. Uh, and I will have uh, uh, all of the all four of these available um, at a discount uh, from uh, their normal pricing for um, that you can get through directortoolkit.com. But it's jot URL. Uh, UTM.io, um, Sharest, and then Switchy. And all of these are UTM uh, uh, creators, URL shorteners, and then Pixel Software, which I'll talk about next week as well, that'll also do remarketing pixels for uh, different AdWords campaigns or other marketing stuff that you're doing as well. Uh, but these offer a myriad of uh, benefits uh, to those UTMs, uh, allows you to store them, uh, do additional content. And like I said, there's a lot of different features, which I won't go into now, but uh, these are, there's some programs that do that for you to make it easier. So it just becomes part of your automatic process. And one thing I'd like to say on these is it seems daunting. Um, and you, it may seem like, no, but I'm not really concerned about that. Or like, who would actually look at this? Um, the, the real value of this really becomes when you get to that point. Um, because if you start doing this stuff, at the very beginning when you're posting to social media um, and you do this over time, the over time stuff becomes where the eye opening stuff comes in because once you have all the data and you can look back, you can see trends over time. Uh, you can really see um, what uh, maybe ha used to work that doesn't now, or you can maybe see uh, consistency in conversions for particular media sources, et cetera, where it's, it paid off in the past and it's paying off now. And I consistently see that that is the way that at least for my business model or my niche that it's going to uh, work for me. Um, and you'll know that's the direction you want to go. If you just, you know, if you don't, if you just start it um, when you have a lot of uh, or making a lot of money or you think you need it, then you don't have any of the historical data to even look at. And so I just reiterate, it's always better to do this kind of stuff early, even though you don't think you need it. Because uh, there's once you start making money and you want to scale. Um, and you want to add that stuff on there later, you, you need to have the data there and it's only going to be there if you start using it um, later or excuse me earlier. So um, this is the last slide for today. Just the bottom line. Um, just remember, um, it's all about, uh, you know, efficiency um, for your company. You know, if you don't know how much is there uh, to improve upon, um, you, you don't know unless you check. And the only way you can check is if you have some data. And the only way you can get that data in today's economy is to add these UTM parameters in order to be able to parse it out. And so, you know, you may you may be in the position where you're making enough money with what you're doing. Um, and you don't care about this. Um, and that's fine. Right. Um, then you, you may just be fine being inefficient and making the money that you're making. And that's perfectly fine. Um but if you're not making enough money, right, or, or um, you may be forced to find where the leaks are in the boat. Because um, a lot of times with the, you know, the the small business or you're doing it on the side uh, or you're not quite making as much money as you want, it could be just because you're wasting time, money and effort on the wrong things. And if you would have focused on the, the things in that picture, the effort uh, of what was actually paying off for you early on, you know, you may actually... Um, scale a little bit faster or make enough money to, to get a virtual assistant to then that would, would scale you up even faster because you're focusing on the right things. Um, and so it may force you to do that. And then if, if you're a larger corporation or you get to a point where you have a couple employees or whatever, um, then at that point, um, you, it probably would behoove you to do this anyway as well, because now um, if you find any any leaks or you plug in those leaks, it's going to be well worth your time to pay somebody or somebody on your team to do that. Because the more the more money you're making or the more money you're spending, the the more the plugging those gaps and, and leaks in the boat are gonna are gonna help you. Because you're just that much when you scale that much and you have that much throughput, um, plugging those those gaps uh, can really make you a, a lot of money and obviously pay for any efforts that you're doing to try to figure out what's working for you guys. So, you know, it's up to you guys to discover and find that sweet spot for your company. Um, you're probably in the, the, you know, somewhere in between the, um, if you're on either, I would say the uh, if you're under the bell curve where the, either you're, um, you're, you're making enough money or you're not making enough money. You probably want to do it. If you're in the middle, maybe, and you're, you're fine with where you're at, you don't want to spend to be uh, a little bit more efficient. You're probably good. You probably don't need to do that at all. Uh, but just think about it for your company. If it's something where you want to get more efficient, you want to scale, you want to get bigger. Uh, at some point, you probably want to have this set up. 
Um, and then if you're small enough where you're you're not making as much money as you want, maybe plugging the leaks and spending your time and money and effort on things that are going to pay off uh, may be worth it for you to do. So any questions on that uh, from anybody um, for the UTMs or or why they think they need it or wouldn't need it or, or exactly what it is uh, specifically? Are you putting these on all your links on your on your site or also on ads that you do off your site? Um, like are you are you all your, all your like I mean are you tracking everything on your directory listing through these? Yeah, so um, when you're doing these are not set up for internal links. So if you're if, if you're linking to your own stuff inside of your own directory, um, that's that's not really what it's uh, set up to do because it uh, it it pulls all that data because um, the analytics I guess are it's like incoming uh, traffic if that okay, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it, once you're already on your site, it's it's not really you're not defining anything, you know. So I, I could I could actually do a, create a, a a link and throw it on Facebook on my group, and I can get. The data from who's clicking on it or how many times it's been clicked and all that kind of stuff yeah exactly because now it's now it's attributable it's not um because if if you put a link to your site on there that's like uh john john's john's uh um um john's business right um when you when somebody clicks on john's business on facebook or your link or your ad it's it's just clicking on john's facebook and so when when the lead comes in from from wherever it's only tracking that baseline Google Analytics stuff. It's it's it it knows the refer referring page, right? It knows where that person's coming from, you know, location and stuff like that. But in terms right. of uh, in terms of uh, any other of those digital marketing things, if you're if somebody's clicking on an email or um, you know any of those other methods where it's just not coming from one site to another, um, you you don't know you don't know where it's coming from or why or what. Uh, what push got, you know, made that marketing campaign, et cetera, et cetera. So. So it's kind of like what affiliate software does or affiliates do. They use the ETMs or. Um, yes, it, it's, it's basically a version of that. So when you see somebody add in the question mark, uh, your email.com, it's basically tagging that URL or that, uh, that exactly that purchase to a person saying, Hey, thank you affiliate. You sent this person from this campaign to my uh, page. They bought. You now get thirty percent of that because I can attribute that to you. And, and so the reason, the same reason you would do that for affiliates and provide uh, money back to them because now you know that affiliate is doing their work because they've referred ten purchases to you. They've made money, but you now can go back to your affiliate program and go. That person just made ten sales for me. Um, the only reason you know that is because there's an attributable link to that affiliate. That that was able to track that, and so this is that's exactly what, um, and that's probably I probably should put that in there. It's a great analogy. That's what those affiliate codes do, and why they're so powerful because you can you can attribute it. Interesting. Because what it, you know, I'm just using an example of uh, you know, uh, let's say an ebook. If if you're posting. Um, to your Facebook group or you're shoving out a, uh, a link to, uh, you know, people that are in your industry and say, hey, uh, click this link for a, an ebook or something. Yeah. If if you don't know that people are actually clicking that and downloading the ebook based off, off of that link and, and nobody's buying uh, your stuff that had, had had looked at that ebook before, you you could have just wasted your time, money on an ebook um, and pushing that out and all your, as opposed to an, an ad and, and you got no sales out of that, but you have no idea. You're just kind of, you know, you're, I guess I would say I, it's kind of, I'm in the military, uh, formerly said so I was a pilot. So I equate it to triple, uh, triple a, when somebody's shooting at you in the air, um, they don't, that, that stuff doesn't actually, they don't know what they're doing. They're just shooting bullets into the air, trying th hoping to hit a plane. Right. Um, they can try to make it more accurate, but that's literally what they're doing. They're just shooting everywhere back and forth, spraying the, the sky with bullets, hoping to hit a plane. That's basically what you're doing without those UTM tracker because you're just making content uh, to make content or adding links or paying uh, paying ads to pay ads, hoping that you're going to make more money at the end of the month. And, you, and you're happy because uh, you're profitable that month. But you have no idea what spend your, or money got you to that location. So this is good for email blasts. 
definitely yeah. like for that's what I think constant contact I must be using because when I I, I use constant contact and um, obviously I see all those weird um, URLs that they create and I guess that's what yep. they're capturing. And they use UTMs or they use a different version of it? Um, I don't know about constant contact. I know, um, I, again, the, uh, it depends what the system is. Uh, they, they probably have their own proprietary thing. Um, yeah. that, that's why I threw out at the beginning of the, of the thing that the UTMs, for any at least uh, uh, analytical things for a website, th those are universal. Um, if, you, if you have a particular um, uh, email marketing system that has its own kind of built-in tracking code, um, that's only going to work for that system, right? And so right. if you move, if you move to, uh, if you're like, oh, constant contacts cost me too much money, I want to move to Aweber or get response. If you take your email templates with you, um, if you don't, if you have the UTMs in the links and the, the templates, they're they're gonna they're gonna roll with you, um, and you can add those templates to somewhere else. Right. If you lose all that data uh, because constant contact maybe has their own system potentially. Uh, now I don't know if I mean, they if constant contact will use. Um, the UTM codes, I don't know for fa for that for a fact. I'll, what I'll probably do is I'll probably probably research maybe what systems use the UTMs. I know any of the analytics stuff, but may not a particular software may not may not use the, the UTMs. I can, made I can forward you a, I can, an email blast that I that I do with them. I basically do it HTML email, and then I copy and paste the code into uh, into their editor because their templates are terrible. Right. Um, but they must be doing something, you know, with the links because they, because you know, I can, I can see how many people opened it and this and that and all that stuff. So they're trying. Well, they, they they're know trying. that the open rate bounce, all that stuff's basically it, that's the email headers and stuff through the systems and the the ISPs and stuff that has nothing to do with your links. Well, the, uh, I meant do the they bottom, have like, the bottom section that has like how many who hit, you know how many hit this link and that link and this link and all that. Okay, so you know which specific link in the email they clicked. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you can see how many. Yeah, how many people? Yeah, clicked on whatever link you have. But yeah, um, and so and again, it's not for everybody. So if you're using a system like that and, and you're only doing email marketing and they already give you that to you, then maybe it's you know maybe it's not worth your time to, to do that. Um, but uh, but again, the uh, that that would maybe. Um, I'm trying to think of the. Uh, like, I like, but I can't really. Yeah, I guess. I mean, the goal is to really get rid of constant contact and use the BD's emails, you know, once there's an, enough people that are registered because I mean, I have like 20,000 emails that I, you know, in my constant contact, but I can't put them into the BD um, database or into the, into the, um, the, um, the email template database to be able to use to send to, you know, mass emails to. Right. Yeah, I don't think BD's ever uh, ever going to kind of be the uh, the email marketing uh, replacement. To be honest, um, it's more of a transactional email system for people who sub uh, subscribe. Um, yeah. So I'd probably stick with uh, another type of marketing. Obviously, some people do cold email marketing. It's not for. It's not set up to do that either. Um, it's it's set up to do some newsletter type things uh, as well. Um, but yeah, it's kind of set up to be yeah. either you're a registered user or you're not. It's not like uploading contacts, which I think you know, but uh, maybe some people just watch it. 200 bucks a month, I like to get rid of, <laughs> cut it down. But yeah, I pay 200 bucks a month for my constant contact. So uh, I would drop that. Are you serious? You pay 200 bucks? Well, I got 20,000. When you have 20,000 uh, email, emails in there, yeah. I get a little discount from my association, but um, it's got the best. The problem is it's so easy to use. I tried, you know, other ones. Even Mailchimp is expensive too. Yeah. Um, but you really need to be sending. If you're doing that, you need to really be sending them out um, emails at least twice a month to get the that two hundred dollar, you know. But yeah, I mean, um, are, you, are you doing? Are, is there some other features of constant contact that you're using that, uh, uh, or is it just mainly the the amount of uh, people you have on there? No, it's just, I'm just I'm just using the email, you know, just to send out emails and get the you know the to see the response rate. The problem is they don't have a great system of of being able to know that. Um, like, let's say you you sent out ten emails in a, in two months, whatever. If like 
if there's like a hundred people that didn't open all of them, you know, there's no way of telling that hundred people didn't open up all of them so I can remove them. So I don't pay for them. So unless you go through individual, each individual um, email that's on there and see what they opened, because you can see what they opened if you go individually, but there's not like a, a report that says, okay, these people haven't opened up an email in, in a year, or these have people haven't opened up an email in six months. Um, you can only see, you know, if right. they, you know, it, it's strange, but um, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think, uh, I'm trying to think if some of the other ones have that, obviously uh, there's some of them that have better uh, uh, segmentation. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Are they segmented or all in one big? Well, they, they are segmented um for some sorts i mean it, this this email list has been going on for since 2002 so yeah, you, you know there's probably i got dead people in there and i got hours a month you got to turn that from an expense into an investment that that's ridiculous yeah because well, i could tell you right now though but with, with for my rental company it's basically my only marketing cost so it's not i have really very low marketing cost so it's the only really thing I can reach out to, you know, all over the country, these this many people, right. even if it, and I'm getting about a 20% open rate, you know, out of, you know, let's say 20,000 emails. So it's pretty right. decent, but there's no other way to get something that cheap out there. So for that well, portion, yeah. yeah but for, at the same time, I'm not, I'm not paying a $800 car payment for a Honda Civic just because that's my only uh, expense I, I have. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't want to pay that much for the, for the Honda Civic. So. Um, what what uh, what I would uh, what Frank was basically saying was I know there's a lot of them that have that deep segmentation or behavior based automation rules where you could filter out and tag people based on their actions off from the email. So, um, for example, Drip I know has uh, where you can segment out. Hey, if 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 they you can say as as anybody ordered or placed an order um, with within the last year. Um, and then you filter them out and like these, these, these people haven't done anything or these people haven't clicked on anything in over a year. I'm just going to get rid of them because they're just kind of, uh, uh, bottom weight or, um, you can, you know, tag them based on certain things where if they open an email, um, in the last, uh, three months, it tags them as, uh, as interested or something like that. Uh, whereas if nobody's clicked in the last three years, they get tagged as disinterested or something like that. Like a tagging. The most important for me is open because realistically not a lot of people click but i think in a sense of, of for marketing for uh for brand mark you know brand awareness like just opening it up to see if, if they open i know they're alive you know i know that they're at least if they're not opening it that's the most important well and, you know sometimes, because then I, sometimes I, an email opens because i read the email before it and it just happened to open it up and then i immediately click off right because i realized i didn't want to open it up <laughs> so true, um true. That's sometimes that, that happens as well, but I, I would definitely look and I don't know, uh, I don't know that much about constant contact um, in terms, uh, but I don't, I don't see in my notes here that they have that money, uh, uh, that much automation. They have simple sequences, um, but um, so, something I have in my notes is that they can't combine conditions or use advanced filtering for constant contact. And so what I mean by that is you can only go like if A, then B, but it can't do a bunch of filtering and do a bunch of stuff based on that. And so um, if that's a concern for you, I, I don't think constant contact does that with the tagging deep, deep segmentation like some of the other ones do. Um, I do know, well, you're in events. So that's the only thing I have flagged for constant contact. It does have the event management. Uh, to do invitations, do registrations, and tickets, or you don't do that at all. I don't do that. Okay, so that's like Eventbrite. Eventbrite does all that, and I, and it's not really something that we really that I do personally for my associations. We use like Eventbrite, and okay, but uh, their, their ticketing system isn't that advanced either. Yeah, I know. It's just a that's, very that's the only extra stuff that I know they have that other people don't necessarily. Um, the, the only thing is different is that you can. What I liked about it is that you, you can send as many emails as you want for that two hundred dollars a month compared to some of them that, that are every time you like every email that e email that's sent is a but is based on how many email addresses is how much you're gonna be paying, if that makes sense. So, so like yeah. in other words, if I had a hundred if I had a hundred emails and I sent out a thousand emails a month, it's the same it would be a cost, you know, very expensive cost if they're doing it by per email address. Compared to who? Compared to the email going out. 
Right. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll try something. You said drip is one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I probably recommend, uh, a Weber get response or, um, send in blue or the three I would probably look at. Um, I, I just, I just was looking at drip cause I kind of has that, that segmentation stuff, but I, I don't normally see many people using that. I was just using that as an example, but, um, the, it kind of depends on what you want to do. I, I, I'd say when you're looking at these email marketing for anybody watching, um, they're all pretty much built the same other than what Jamie said, either um, some of them restrict the number of people and it's unlimited sends or other people have unlimited people, but limit the sends. Um, th that's one kind of uh, right field and left field that you want to want to consider. And then uh, after that, um, the, the biggest thing you probably want to do is, is focus on what, what item or what feature Am, do I need like I, I it has to do X, Y or Z and then and then find the one that does that um, because the rest of the, the stuff in terms of obviously deliverability is key and some of them are different things, but um, they're all pretty much the same. Um, I know there's some difference in some whether they allow affiliate links and not affiliate links. So Matt, maybe another one where if they are like, hey, there's no affiliate marketing on our network and you do affiliate marketing and then probably don't want to use them. Um, but uh yeah, th those are the, the big things. So maybe maybe we can go over that another week as uh, kind of like email marketing. The problem with that is is, is they're uh, they're all kind of um, you know everybody's going to have a different opinion on it. Like uh, they're all fairly fairly good. They all work pretty good. And and, and to be honest, once you start using one um, for a while, then then you you start getting used to it, even though maybe that's not the not the best uh, you know best one. But you're just used to using it, and so it's hard to get a, right. get away from that. Or it's just good enough where you're like, I, there's no no reason for me to switch to to A because I have to, I have B. Um, so so that's that's something uh, you know you just got to think about. And it, but if it if it doesn't if there's something specific that you want um, that may uh, may want, want you to use one over the other. So maybe, maybe think about that. Um, and then, uh, you know, of what you want to do. Um, I'll just throw this one out there, uh, for everybody on here. I'm going to share my screen real quick and, and this may help you, uh, Jamie, I'm not sure, but there is a, um, there is a service that's right now a, a really, I, I think a pretty good deal for, for what it is. Um, right now it's a, 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 I guess a discount off the normal price. And, uh, what this is, is a, I'll kind of show it to you here. So it's, um, it's mailvio.com, M-A-L-V-I-O.com, mailvio. And they've got a 40% off coupon right now. Um, and what it, this is a reseller version basically but it's what version of uh send in blue so uh, i'll type that in here if, if you guys uh, uh have never seen it it's a very very good autoresponder um and you can kind of look through here for the features uh what mail video is basically they bought a bunch of uh, resale rights to here and it's basically a white label but it's uh it's set up uh it's it's this entire service um that they're using but the the, the thing uh, that may be good for you uh jamie is that it's it's discounted since they're white label they can kind of give it as a discount and then it's set up for twenty five thousand contacts uh, and unlimited emails so um, twenty five thousand contacts unlimited emails and then they um, it's right now it's uh, with that discount it's basically two hundred and ninety seven a year so two ninety seven a year basically for about twenty five dollars a month um, you can have the the full send in blue. Uh, platform with uh, 25,000 and unlimited cents. So take a look at that, um, the send in blue, and then see if it's. What's that? And do it through MailVio, though, not through direct. Yeah, just go through them. So, so weird thing on like this, but the, this, this kind of shows you the different extremes. So even on the same service, obviously, you can have both. Uh, both the, uh, you know, ends of the uh, the extreme. So this one, their normal service has um, 
unlimited contacts and then they limit the, the emails, which uh, I don't know how many emails you're sending, but a million emails a month is a lot anyway. But um, so that's that's the normal service. The mail view for some reason is doing the opposite where they have um, they limit your contacts, uh, but they give you unlimited emails. And so the uh, one of the reasons they do that is because they they kind of uh, um, they have a, a system set in place. So they kind of uh, ramp you up to the unlimited email. So they kind of uh, uh, they're protective, I guess, a little bit of uh, of the uh, of the service and their IP addresses and stuff like that. Um, so if you get them and you want to start send, you have a, a history of, you know, sending a large, uh, gr- you know, group of emails to like 25,000 people. You kind of, I think you just have to get with them, uh, do a con- consultation with them, kind of show you what you normally do just to kind of get the green light to go straight off there. Cause they, what they don't want is, uh, people, since they have the, uh, unlimited emails, they just don't want a bunch of spammers that are just going to start, you know, spamming, you know, millions of emails a day. Um, they want to make sure that you're the company. So, um, that's the only caveat I'd throw out. out there. If they have, I mean, if they have that, that feature where I can, you know, every month look and see who didn't, who I can, like, I can group whoever didn't open them and just delete them. That'd be great. Yeah. So, um, so that's in the, uh, the CRM and marketing, uh, automation on here. So let me, do, I, I'm just going to speak off the hip here because I wasn't necessarily prepared to do this. I think it does have that on there. So let's kind of browse through there real quick, but, um, it has those, uh, those different automation, uh, features where you can kind of look through there and I think tag them, uh, based on, uh, different parameters. My internet is really slow. So hopefully this comes up for us, but, Why are you doing that? I got a quick question about BD. You know yeah. how when when uh, when someone you have a pending uh, video or or um, photo that has to be approved, and you, you have that little red in the back, you have like a little red number, and you can tell that there's content. They, they, it kind of tells you that to go to your content area and, and look at them in the back of the, in the back yes. office. Yeah, yeah. How come they don't do that for members that are pending? Or is there a way of setup to set that up where the little red thing shows up when members are still not active? Because I, I approve every member, except for general users that are not visible at all. Um, there's not a setting for that. I, I know what you're saying though. Um, where where it because so basically if if you have it set to admin auto or admin must approve that it kind of shows up that there's people that have just not activated their email or not, uh, not been activated. So, so basically um, every, every paid customer or every paid, um, member I have to approve. So, cause I, I basically right. wait till their, their, their profile is, is finished so that it doesn't look like it's unfinished. Plus I want to make sure they're not some bull crap, but it, uh, when I go in it, there's nothing telling me that, Hey, look at your member list and make sure that you're, you check people that are not approved yet. Yeah, but, I think, I think I, part of the, I think part of the problem with that though, uh, Jamie, is that it becomes uh, useless data after a little bit because if you have enough people in your database, um, you're going to have people that are are just you're not activated or you put on hold or um, that you change your mind later and some people get activated and they get the only way they get activated is if they uh, pr- you know approve their email or verify their email and then and then they're then they're turned on. So at that point, it becomes one of those. Uh, it just you just see a number on there because as long as you have one or two that are not um, that that you're not you're kind of on hold or, or the number becomes meaningless. It's never going to get to zero, and th- and then you just have numbers floating there literally forever uh, because it's mm-hmm. not like a, a, a one and done cleanup item. It depends on how a particular directory is utilizing that. I think it, th- that's that's the only thing I could think of, but it, it's not it's not set up to do that. It's it's worth a suggestion maybe in the. You know the forum there for right. tagging on there. Well, even if you could, you can set it where only um, non-active. You know, I don't know. It was just a thought. Yeah. Um. So. So let me. Uh, let me. That's not what I want. I want uh, marketing automation. So this there has a CRM there where you can. Uh, you know, organize contacts uh, based on you know source uh, where they're at in the funnel, other criteria, um, and I've got some I've got some pictures of that as well. I don't see it on here. I don't know if they took it off, but I, I do have pictures of it. Um, the big um, the big thing here, um, 
actually, I'm just going to move this over to the screen here because um, this internet's taking forever. Can you see my uh, my one note here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so this is some screenshots from Sunday in Blue. Obviously, you can uh, you can set uh, depth of campaigns so you can per person on the CRM. You can kind of see. Um, you can give them a rating based on how active they are and kind of have, have that set up. Um, you can see when they're registered, give them an ID number. You can also see all their campaign history on whether they've uh, read it or opened it or clicked it and what time and date they did uh, through all those. You can see all their transactions um, and then which uh, web pages they visited based off from their click to know whether, what, you know, what experience they've had or what different web pages they've seen. So that's kind of the CRM piece. Um, you can see which list they're registered on. If you have multiple lists, you can kind of see all that. That's a CRM. But what you also have is a marketing automation trigger. Um, you can basically send emails uh, to any number of triggers that you set. So if, if somebody's visited a given page, um, you can send them an email. If somebody's abandoned their shopping cart, you can send them an email. If they just if they just subscribed within a certain time frame, uh, you can start sending them emails. If it's their birthday, you can send them something. If they if they clicked on a specific right. link on your site, you can send it to them. So basically. Um, you can set up in the in the workflow types a a custom workflow. So based on um, the anniversary date, what pages they visit, uh, an actual event on a website. So if they do something specific on the website, so let's say they went to a website and they clicked on the webinar link to go to the webinar, I can send everybody that's clicked on the webinar link or if they bought a specific product. Um, and then here's some of the other ones maybe that um, – that you're looking at marketing activities that you can send email based on whether they have opened or clicked on an, a specific email con a campaign, or maybe whether they've opened or clicked on a particular transaction, uh, transactional email. So basically every one of those workflows, you can set up a, a, uh, a, a kind of almost like a chat bot type of thing where um, after they're added to there, uh, you can do if then else, uh, time to things of yes and no. And then if, if they haven't done this, uh, then it goes to here and then you can kind of set up multiple workflows, um, and have different actions and conditions based on those particular things. So for example, they have a delay here. So maybe, um, maybe if they clicked on a link within the last week, you delay for two weeks. And then if they haven't done anything, opened an email or clicked on a, a link within the last month, you send it, it, and that delay trips, maybe a, one month later. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've gotten some of these where from systems where you're like, hey, we noticed you haven't logged into your HubSpot account in the last month. Yeah. Uh, is everything okay? Is there anything else we can do? Click here to, to see what, what we've been up to lately, that kind of thing. You can kind of set up different conditional sends of, of that um, based on, uh, on that. And then you can also... Um, you can also do list segmentation that we kind of talked about. So you basically group contacts um, mm -hmm. uh, based on different segments. So it could be gender, geography, purchase history, you know, opening stuff. So you basically say, hey, any email readers with a unique opening between this date and this date, um, or wow. if they've uh, opened that this campaign at all, um, you can add them to a specific uh, list segmentation. And so now, now that you have a, a, a segmented list, you can basically go, hey, um, with this, uh, this segmentation list I, I call marketing autom automation, I have 13 people that have not responded or clicked an email in the last four months and also have not bought something from me or something like that. And so you can then either include or exclude uh, people from different campaigns based on, you know, those particular uh, segmentations. So, um, do you, do you use this? sorry, say it again. Do you use this for yourself? Um, I, I did. I, well, I just bought it cause they just opened up uh, that sale thing yesterday. And so I don't know when this is going to close down. Um, but it, it's normally, let me look at this. It's normally $497, I think a year, which is still, um, still pretty good um, based off from Send and Blue. So it's basically at the, uh, you know, the normal or that $47 a month thing. So it's normally $497. They've got that $200 off code um, for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think there's also a, I think they also add 25,000 contacts right now, or maybe, maybe it was just yesterday. We'll see. I'll, I'm going to have to ask, but they, they were offering a bonus where you just email them and then they'll give you 50,000 contacts instead of uh, 25,000, right? So I just and bought then, this. 
Go they're okay with upload. Like I can take my, I can export my list and upload it there. They won't have any problem with it. I know some email marketing companies are like, you know, all these, they're really strict about uploading emails. Um, well, they, they do allow affiliate marketing and net, affiliate networking. So that's why I mentioned that they're, they're fine with that again, as long as you're not uh, spamming. Um, I'd have to look at that on that one. That's a great question. I, I think, uh, I think you can. Let me let me let me double check to make sure that has that capability. Um, Have you uploaded some, yours yet? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I, I like I said, I just did it yesterday. So uh, let's see. Let's see if they can upload down here. These are just my notes I've taken over time. Let's see, HTML editor. I'd, I'd probably check on that for the uh, the the upload piece, and I I don't. Some of these other ones I have put on there that you can upload it, and I just didn't I didn't do it on this one. I don't think, and so I don't. That They're doesn't mean that they don't have it. It may I'm just freak out with it. Um, I think I, I think it just would it would require a uh, like we we're talking about if if you have a an ex experienced thing uh, with that that you've done it before just to kind of prove that you have what what your business is or whatever to turn that on immediately I think is the only thing you probably have to do but um, yeah I don't see you can send, I'm sure you can send it from any email address that you have like in other words if I have like sales at and info at I can pick which ones that send it'll send from so but i can look yeah. at it i'll look at it I'm sure so anyway there's a couple deals that may help you out so ryan all right um well anything uh hopefully that helped jamie uh um frank anything else from you or jamie anything? did corey show up did corey Tori. Oh no. Okay. Did, um, did they ever? You know, I'm kind of new to BD. I mean, I've been using it since like April. Yeah. Um, the, what really surprised me is that you cannot move a subcategory to another category. Yeah, so they just announced on the webinar on Wednesday that that's coming shortly. That's in. Uh, but it's it's close enough that they revealed it on the webinar, so I think probably a, a couple of weeks and and they'll have that. So oh yeah, because uh, they have yeah. the field, they have the fields there. All I have to do is make them a drop down to move them to the different. Yeah, obviously it's a bit more technical issue than that. They got to develop oh, to yeah. do that. But you're right. it is it, it makes a, it almost it looks like you should be able to do it right, um, yeah. and you just can't. So what what webinar was that? Their, um, their webinar. Yeah, they do one every Wednesday or every other Wednesday night at seven thirty yeah. or seven. Sorry, it's weird. Is that I, I signed up to that one right when I started using it, and I never get any emails from them. And I asked, I even mentioned it again to them to like notify us when they have their webinars. And I don't know how I found you, but um, I thought originally when I did the webinar the first time is that you guys you were part of the company because <laughs> yeah, I mentioned no. something to. Me. So I watched. I watched the. the I watched one of your other webinars and what is this magic um, plus search bar or something? You, met, you you mentioned something and you were able to go to a page and see all the code. You were, you were, I forgot what, what actually I sent actually the actual link to them. I can see probably all the look code. at it. I, can you explain what I did or what I did again? What, what, what happened? Yeah, here, I'm going I'm to put it in the, 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 the it's actually, I'll, let me do this, make it easier. Because I thought, I'm like, hey, you guys, I watched one of your webinars and you mentioned this. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, and they go, oh, that's not us. I'm like, oh, okay. And I, and I they go, they go send, send us the, the the link and the, let me see. I have it right here. Um, I just put it in the chat or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, oh, here. I think this is yours. I hope it's you guys. Um, so it's at the 647 mark. 
Excuse me, Ryan. I got to run. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. All right. All right. So, uh, six for us. Magic plus. Server. Okay. Hold on. Let me pull up. I mean, obviously, I don't know exactly the words you used, but that's what I got. <laughs> Didn't mean to be rude. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Oh, sorry. Okay. How many people? Uh, let, me, are... uh, let me screen. I think everybody is slowly dropped off as I started to get into your email marketing thing, I think. So it's just, I think it's just you and me. So I think you're good. Um, okay. is this what you want? Is this what you wanted to ask me about? Uh yeah, that was one of the things. And then okay. um I want to talk to you about other stuff that when we when you, so you see this. Is that what you said? 640, yeah, around 647. <laughs> 645 is good. Okay, hold on. So let me let me screen share here. So are you using is this Zoom that you're using or what are you using? Uh, this is a live webinar. Hmm. It's funny how like Zoom became Kleenex. I know. I need to zoom you. Okay. <laughs> All that stuff happens, how instantaneous it becomes part of the, uh, uh, the, the language. Yeah. It's like Google. But to have something that like everybody's like, oh, you use Zoom. Zoom is probably the worst platform out of all of them in the sense of security and all that. Is that you? So we're going to go edit. Yeah. Go back to terrible the resolution. Huh. Yeah, I know. Okay. So we're talking about banner ads. But when you go to the, go back to the, like, around uh, 640, go to 640 and I'll tell you where it is. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's good enough. Let's start. I guess the video in a video is very bad quality. I don't see that many special ones. Sometimes people have one gold and a plus. So we're going to go to the gold and a plus. Okay, so that was the like search bar. Um, so that was that. Um, let me let me go back to uh, the the web here. Sorry, that was that one. There we go. Um, so I, when I when I said I call it magic because you can kind of click on it to see where, where everything's at. When you when you're in the back end and you click on the visit website. Um, that's what I showed you earlier on in, yeah. in the webinar. When, when you do that from the admin panel, it knows you're the admin. It auto automatically overlays the this admin uh, toolbar on the left hand side. And so what I what I kind of meant by the magic yeah, plus, I, I meant search. You see how it's search? It looks like a little search glass or a little uh, magnifying glass. Um, okay. It, and it has a plus sign in there. So all it is is that's it's the show widget button in the admin overlay section here and by doing that when you click that that plus thing what it does is it highlights um the code basically kind of opens it up and kind of shows what widget code or what uh url you know what text label uh is in there now well, that's why everything started slowing down it started to do my backup um so can you do you understand what I'm saying now where you can kind of see all the widget codes and everything or wi what the widget things yeah. are? And then I, I call it magic because it basically, it, it, it you just one click straight into um, where you want to be. Come on. Um, so for example, uh, bear with my back up there until I close it out. Um, when it, if, if you want to edit this one, all the red ones, I think I mentioned this last week, but all the red ones are default. You haven't changed that which I think would be the opposite, but that, that means you haven't touched it. And then all of the purple or blue ones here means you've edited something. So if you see that, I've edited something on the 
on the the header code there because it's blue. These are all standard, standard. Oop, I added something there. And then uh, I added change the sidebar. But anyway, there's one click in there and you can get to the code. So for example, if you're like, oh, I need to I need to edit something on um, the the hero divider. I want to change the code here. Uh, you just one click that widget and it automatically opens up the uh, it searches for and find that in the admin and automatically opens it up to that that hero divider. Now I can just customize it. I don't have to go find that or figure out which one it is. Now I know if I edit that code or that field or that form, that's going to you know change that part of the website. Uh, similarly, yeah, like all these. All these yellow ones are are, are keywords or are the uh, the text labels. So if you're like, I don't want that to say search now. I want to I want it to just say uh, search. Now you can just go click on that. It'll open up that text label in the back end automatically for you. And then uh, you're like, I don't want to say search now. I want to say search, and then you just save. So you just clicked on the the the, the yellow or orange, whatever you call that one. Yeah, the yellow. Yeah, because I was trying to figure out how to change the word classified everywhere to marketplace. And, you know, I, I was it was taking, you know, I went this I went through the text labels and got a few of them. And then I was just going crazy. So I just emailed or I created a ticket and they couldn't even give me the answer to all the ones because there's there's a there's a word the classified shows up on. Um, when you're in your dashboard. On, but do you still have the, the problem? Sidebar. Or? You still have that problem? Oh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been able to do it. So um, now that I know that I can just go to. Um, well, I mean, the website, just, I mean right? you want to tell me the site or whatever, but um, some of them are hidden. Like uh, sometimes they're in the code, but you're not going to see that. So this is an example. Um, and uh, actually, this is a great example of what I talked earlier about not having the right SEO content. Like I just have toolkit as the as the profession or something on my thing. And so. Mine's not set up. It just says find toolkits. That doesn't make, and that doesn't make any sense. Somebody's going to search for toolkits, um, right? It should right, say right, find, right. find resources or something. Um, but this is one of those that that doesn't show up good. Like if you do that, it, this isn't highlighted. It's not even in a widget. It's uh, it's kind. Of, this one's a little bit hidden on, on this one. So there's a couple of those that are a little bit strange or hard to find. But which, I mean, which one specifically? If you go to your website, what or if you want to give me the link, like what can't you? figure out still or what did, what did they tell you they couldn't find well i well i they sent me back saying you know oh you got to change it in here and i changed it in that spot like but then i